By the time the search party found the hikers deep within the Ural Mountains, most people had already anticipated that this would be a recovery effort as opposed to a rescue mission. It had been weeks since the last time anybody had heard from them, and the area they were traversing was known to be extremely cold and harsh. This was Siberia, after all. One day, while searching for the lost troop, a helicopter pilot noticed something that appeared out of place on a mountain called Hola Siko, or Death Mountain. As the pilot drew closer, they noticed that what he was looking at was a tent. Quickly, rescuers began to descend upon the campground. After reaching the site, the search party was greeted with an extremely bizarre sight. For starters, the tent had been ripped apart from the inside and still contained all the hikers' supplies, which were still neatly organized. This pointed to the notion that the hikers had left the tent in a hurry. Next, rescuers noticed a series of nine distinct sets of footprints that led away from the campsite and into the tree line. After following these imprints for a couple hundred meters, they soon came across a grisly sight. The frostbitten bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Georgia Krivonoshenko were next to a long, dormant fireplace. Weirdly enough, both bodies were found in their underwear, even though it had been around negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit for most of the month. Eventually, three more bodies would be discovered during the search that day. However, the last four hikers wouldn't be found until May, thanks in part to the spring thaw. Unfortunately, with these bodies came more questions. Specifically, investigators not only wondered what on earth could prompt nine professional mountain climbers to abandon the safety of their tent in a blizzard, but also, what could have possibly inflicted the injuries that were present on the deceased? As it turned out, they didn't all die from exposure. Among the various injuries inflicted, some of the more eyebrow-raising ones include fractured skulls, broken ribs, crushed body cavities, third-degree burns, a missing eye, and even a ripped-out tongue. And as if things couldn't get any weirder, the bodies appeared to be radioactive. As you can imagine, the bizarre state of these bodies resulted in all kinds of theories being thrown around. These range all the way from the mundane to the absolutely insane. Government cover-ups, avalanches, aliens, and even a Russian Yeti have all been proposed. If you're like me, you'll probably scoff at the mention of some of these outlandish theories. Like really? Aliens? A Yeti? Absolutely ridiculous. Right? Well, as it turns out, there's actually one thing that's crazier than all those theories combined. There's actually evidence to back them all up. everyone and welcome back to you go first podcast i'm fernando today joined always by my co-host austin austin hey, Fern- how are you feeling about this today oh i'm really pumped up for this one i yeah. uh, i have my own theory and i'm ready to shit on your theory because i know you're gonna i know you're okay, gonna <laughs> listen i know my theory is probably the most outlandish one like there's probably no, not a yeti right like there isn't but i want to believe dude i i, I <laughs> I want it to be that because it would be interesting, but it's not a Yeti. I'm telling I you. I know. I know it's probably not a Yeti. <laughs> like it's probably aliens, honestly. <laughs> but listen, well, listen, really, really quick before we get into the whole story and the evidence. Just it takes a lot to rip off a tongue. It does. Like, it does. I agree. I agree. I don't think it's no avalanche. I don't think it's no like. Like listen, unless like the avalanche is so forceful that it causes someone to like bite so hard on their tongue that it just falls off. I don't know. Right. I feel like a lot of like stuff would have to go, go right for that to happen that way. Don't worry. I'm coming into this armed with lots of ammunition. Okay. All right. But well, I'm we ready to get there. I promise. I'm ready to, sh- ready to the- shut it down. <laughs> right. No, I, I promise. I'm very excited for this. I've had my own theories about this for a long time. And yeah, I remember actually the first time I ever heard about this story was maybe six or so years ago uh, at our old job from our my favorite manager of all time, Jaden, dude. I know. Well, he uh, will talk to you all day about the stuff. This is right I'm pretty sure alley. that man lives off the grid <laughs> and has a like that cork board at oh, home yeah. with yarn going everywhere. Yeah, it's like what is this? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Like, yeah, where he's Pepe like Sylvia, dude. <laughs> just like Pepe <laughs> Sylvia. This name keeps coming up. <laughs> Who is he? Dude? <laughs> no, he uh, so I actually uh, a couple months ago, I actually 3D printed him a Sasquatch. It's sitting, on his, de- it's sitting on his desk right now. That's that's very so, sweet. So, if the day ever comes, I leave. At least he'll have that to rem- remember yeah. me by. I'm actually gonna give you something when you come to visit me to give to him, it's 
it's Tom Brady magazine. I just know how much he loves Tom <laughs> Brady. Dude. Yeah, he he's obsessed with like sports and stuff like that. Yeah, so the he's, Patriots he's nerd, and baseball. Dude. Oh, sorry, me. Ooh. There's some ASMR. We are not sponsored by Red Bull. Just so you know. I don't think Red Bull would ever want to sponsor. We sponsor us, Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe whatever you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, good. So we got we both got some theories going into this, and obviously we're going to cover all theories. And well, we're going to cover all the the most common ones. Yeah, the popular, the fun ones, the know. popular ideas. Unfortunately, I'm going to be a Debbie Downer because I don't think I believe in the crazy ones. But, I mean, but we're going to cover them. You're always a downer. All right. We ready to hop into it? I think so. You ready for the story? All right. By the way, uh, disclaimer, there's lots of Russian names in here. And the <laughs> pronunciation Austin is has be... promised me these pronunciations are going to be 100% accurate. They're going to be horrendous. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. All right, I took Russian go. in high school. <laughs> I took Spanish for four years and I still, <laughs> I, I none of it was retained. The Duolingo bird is like, dying from depression on my phone right now all right on december 27th 1959 igor diatlov and nine other experienced mountain climbers began their arduous journey into the siberian tundra their mission would be to reach the summit of gora or torin or mount torin if all went to plan the hikers would accomplish this task by february 12th as they carried out their journey Dyatlov's party recorded all the locations they visited, as well as the events that occurred throughout their adventure. They also took photographs of all the beautiful landscapes they encountered, and even did a bit of 1950s-style vlogging, which was basically just them taking pictures of themselves setting up camp and climbing up things, you know, with them in the picture. Um, I thought vlogging stands for video <laughs> logging, though. It, it, you know, well, there was no video back so, then. So, yeah, wouldn't that just be <laughs> blogging? Anyways, I'm nitpicking. Go ahead. You are. It's 1950s vlogging. Anyways... <laughs> Even though the weather was extremely unforgiving, hovering around the negative 30s Fahrenheit, the pack of mountaineers made good time and were in high spirits throughout most of the trip. This can be confirmed because as they traveled, they stopped in small villages to send postcards back to their loved ones. At no point did anybody suspect they'd veered off course or had run into any serious problems. That is very bizarre to me. Like, you know, you think like, not trying to shit on the mail service, but mail today isn't very fast. And these people were literally stopping in remote russian villages and dropping off postcards saying hey we're alive we're here blah 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 blah. i don't know why it's just weird to me and it's going to come up a little later about you know how this kind of tips people off as to something's wrong but i don't know it just feels weird i I don't the 50s felt less developed especially in like rural russia it just feels like it would be a lot less developed than that but apparently not (laughs) maybe maybe the russian postal service is just that great you know (laughs) Like, I know, like, the, the American motto is neither rain nor sleet nor snow. They'll still get the mail to you or whatever. Maybe maybe Russia's the same way, dude. Like, out in the wilderness, they'll, they'll deliver that mail no matter what. I mean, it used to be true. Now, if you leave, like, a garbage can, hey, well, yeah, they're going yeah, 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 to make, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. sorry. We told you no mail gets delivered today. My that, apologies. That is true. They were also <laughs> beating us, you know. That's a whole other thing, but they actually were beating us at the space race for a while. So you know. Oh yeah, no, 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 for sure. So maybe they're beating us at the at the weather or the the mail front too. Who knows? They're tough hey. SOBs, dude. Yeah, they are. Sorry, did you hear that? I thought I did. Oh, you know what? I think that's our. <laughs> I think that's our rice cooker. Oh, I was like, is that my washing machine? Because I was like, I was like, is that? <laughs> no, that's on you. I think. Yeah, it's it's, it's a rice cooker. Sorry, we want to eat. Oh well. Can we eat, my precious lord? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why you have to do the podcast. <laughs> Promise me I can eat. <laughs> Maybe next time. Austin's mom, he won't let me eat. <laughs> I'm cutting this out. She's never going to hear it. <laughs> this sentiment would also be continuously expressed in their diaries. That was until February 1st. On this date, the following journal entry was recorded. It is difficult to imagine such a comfort on the ridge. With shrill howling wind, hundreds of kilometers away from the human settlements. And that's it. Like that's that was the last thing they ever sent, or not sent. So that's the last thing they ever that's wrote. The last, that's the last postcard ever received. Basically, that wasn't a postcard. That was in the diary. Mm. So it's kind of I don't know. Some people say it sounds kind of cryptic. I just think it's them talking about how crazy it is to be away from everybody. It, yeah, know. that just sounds like someone out in the middle of the woods. Well, in this case, the tundra, away from civilization, being like, "Yo, this is nuts." <laughs> like, I mean, I know. I know when I'm ever like 
not that I'm ever out that crazy, but when I'm like super out far hiking or something, I'm just like, wow, this is very quaint and serene and peaceful, like from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. So I think it would be pretty cool. I mean, I would never want to do that because I'm not an outdoorsy person, but it, it I, would be pretty cool to be around like away from civilization and just on an impressive journey like that. Don't get me wrong. I like winter sports, but I like gravity sports where you're going down the mountain and the lift brings you up and I'm wrapped in like modern Gore-Tex and I'm warm <laughs> and comfy. And when I'm tired, I can go into the lodge and eat some poutine. <laughs> that's that's my idea of like fun winter sports. Hiking yeah, so into as you can <clears throat> as you can clearly tell, neither of us would ever last on this expedition. Oh not no no no! That, not I that would, they did either. <laughs> I would maybe get because it is all in like cross country skis, and I've tried car, yeah cross country skiing, and I'm not very good at it. Um, I would go maybe maybe a mile because I wouldn't want to disappoint everybody. But then after that, I can't do this. I'm sorry. Bye, guys. That's it. I'm out. Peace. Fe February 12th finally came and went, but no further correspondence from the hikers came with it. <clears throat> At first, their families initially chalked it up as delays in the mail Chalk system. It. See? There's a del the delays in the mail system. See? I'm not, I'm not being a jerk. They believed it, too. However, after a couple weeks went by with not so much as a single peep, their family's nonchalant mentality quickly morphed into dread. After it became clear that Dyatlov's group wasn't coming back on their own, a search party was promptly formed and put into action. Wait, so how long? Because this is without like, so nowadays, you know, if you don't get a text or a call, <laughs> like people are like, after a day, they're like, hey, where's where's Austin or whatever, right? So February 12th came. Like, I mean, how long? Like, they gave it two weeks. They gave okay. it about roughly, so, they gave it two weeks. Like, we so two heard weeks anything. from February 12th? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they hadn't heard anything back. So, yes. So, okay. Yeah. For sure, something would be, yeah, something would be awry the there. They're like, yeah, the mail service sucks out here, but it ain't that bad. Uh, yeah, two <laughs> weeks is tough. Like, that's a long time, dude. Plus, um, you know, they had the Because they were like, supposed to be done by the 12th, right? They were supposed to arrive at, you know, Death Mountain. like or Actually, it was our summit. Was it after. called Death Mountain or was it called Death Mountain after they died? <laughs> no, it was actually. So the locals referred to it as, like, the indigenous population actually referred to it as Death Mountain. Okay. Um, But. What is that in Russian again? Can I get a, can I get a check? <laughs> Gora a Torton. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. Uh yeah, so you know, they I don't think they were actually Wait, why did I think it was why did I think it was something else? I thought it was uh Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Gora Gora, Gora, Gora Sakal, dude. Yes, Gora Torton was their destination, but they had to get through Death Gora Mountain. Sakal. Gora <laughs> Sakal. Fast forward to February 26, the search party would find the group's abandoned campsite and the remains of five of the nine hikers. This includes Igor Dyatlov on the side of Kolatsiko, or, or Death, Death Mountain, Mountain, as the locals called it. At first, the bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Georgia Krivonoshenko were discovered a couple hundred meters from the tent and were located next to a fire pit. Unsurprisingly, both had died from exposure. Mm -hmm. What was odd, though was the fact that both bodies were in their underwear, despite the sub-zero weather. Additionally, Krivonashenko had third-degree burns on his hands. Now, I mean, I'm not a... Can you get... Because frostbite, isn't that like a burn, technically? It is, but it's it's different. It definitely was from So heat. it, this was it from is heat. from heat. Okay. Although, okay. I, you know, it's kind of given away by the fire pit, let's face it. Yeah, you like, know. he probably, like... I mean, maybe he had hypothermia so bad, he, like, Shoved literally put his hand in the fire yeah i mean you know and it's like painful it's and maybe they like hit a point of psychosis where like they were like hallucinating so bad from like the hypothermia or whatever that yeah i'm just gonna uh, nothing's gonna warm me up unless i'm oh, touching the fire yeah i mean like hell like in, in no joke in tupper lake not right anymore you know, for whatever reason that is. But we used to get like in February, we'd get like a week of negative 30 degree weather. Like we'd get slapped with it. And... Oh, we used to do that, get that in Vermont too, but I don't know, something changed. I don't know. But you know, when you, when you're out there, it's cold. I mean, like you can't be out there very long. any exposed skin for more than like, you know, a few minutes, especially when the wind's whipping and it's no longer negative 30 degrees. It's negative 40, 45 with wind chill. Did you ever do the boiling water? <laughs> <laughs> no i did not do the boiling water <laughs> some people i've seen videos i've also seen it go right I've seen badly videos too. I, that's why i'm saying i feel like you'd be the type of person to do the boiling water thing 
no and no. if anyone doesn't know what i'm talking about it's when like you take a, a pot of boiling water outside and you you th- like it's usually when it's like negatives right negative degree fahrenheit and you throw it in the air and it's supposed to evaporate before it hits the ground uh, yeah well seen some people where basically people get like i don't know if it's first second or third degree but they get burned pretty badly well it's because it's not cold enough <laughs> that's the problem they they're like oh it's cold and like you know, it's everybody's like idea <laughs> of cold is very dependent upon where you live. Oh, dude, when I lived in Texas, <laughs> there was a parade like every Thanksgiving kind of like, I mean, it's not Macy's or anything, but uh, I remember one year some dude made a killing selling blankets because people were freezing to watch the parade and it was 60 degrees. It was 60 degrees and they were cold. <laughs> oh, people had like the North Face jackets or the equivalent of it at the time. Like, like Texans are not used to like like if it snows anywhere in the south, like I, I remember it snowed like three inches in in Louisville, Kentucky, one year I lived there, and I was like at work. I worked at a hotel, and I was a mile from home, and people were staying. Like people were like, "Oh, it's too dangerous to drive. Like I'm just gonna stay in the hotel tonight. Like I'll like employees were just gonna sleep in the hotel, like get a room, and they offered me one. I'm like. It's like I could walk home if I wanted right, to. Like, right. We're not, not scared and of I'm the like, snow. And I'm like, that's fine. So like, I just drove home. Like, I had winter tires. I was fine. But like, it's funny, man. Like, it's just like they shut down the city, dude. So a couple years ago, kind of going circling back to talk about Jaden, uh, he had to go down to Texas for work, and that was oh, when that Austin, big snowstorm yeah. hit. Hmm. And it's funny because he was working with a lot of people. Oh, in the Texas. the one that hit in Texas that yeah, well, that yeah, was yeah. bad because the power grid went off. Right. Like, yeah, it was bad. He was down there for that, and it's funny because. A lot of people that he was working with because he was used to driving in the snow. Yeah. They're like, can you come pick us up? Because I don't know how to drive in the snow. It's just funny how like, like to me, I you can't survive like up here if you don't, if you don't know how to drive in the like snow. Uber, dude. Like if you can't drive in the snow up here, I don't, you're done. I mean, I don't know what to tell you because up here it's not like, oh, it's you. Oh, we got three feet of snow. No job is going to be like, Hey, by the way, you can just, we're closing. No. Three feet of snow, five feet of snow. Guess what? You're coming into work. Get in the car and drive here. <laughs> so yeah, it's like a, it's just a survival skill up here. You need to know how to drive in the snow. The would be rescuers would find an additional three more bodies, like that of the others. It was found that these individuals had also died from exposure. <laughs> Unlike the others, however, one of the hikers had been found to suffer from a fractured skull. Listen, dude, I don't know if an avalanche <laughs> is fracturing your skull. Mm. Like I know, I know it's a lot of force, right? So maybe it would. I don't know. I mean, we don't have avalanche experience, but. Well, I remember once. <laughs> no, um, I actually. That sounds like Yeti business, dude. I'll, I'll save it for the theory. That's but squash behavior. I, I promise. I've come here armed, man. I am. I'm here to just be a negative Nancy and be like, I know. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I know. That's my place on this podcast. <laughs> You are. You're a Debbie. I downer. don't bring joy. I'm sorry. You are. You suck the fun out. You literally are like, I don't know what sucks, dude. What, I don't know. A mosquito, dude. You're like a mosquito, right? You're just like sucking the fun. Sucking the fun out of everything. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Oh my god, dude. Uh, as you're, suspected, you're so. Uh, weird. <laughs> oh you know what i got a name for your skeleton we'll call him skeeter dude skeeter okay i like that skeeter. okay it's a skeeter and uh sticks skeeter and sticks as suspected foul play was becoming more and more of a possibility criminal investigators were called in to try and make heads or tails of the mysterious crime scene unfortunately for investigators getting to the bottom of this puzzle wouldn't be an easy task mm-hmm. additionally it would only become more complicated when the bodies of the four hikers were found months later this time around, the bodies were found to have had even more absurd injuries inflicted upon them. This included the likes of fractured skulls, once again, crushed ribs, a missing tongue, and a missing eye, and even the presence of radioactive signatures found on their clothes. Okay, so, so if you wait, think... Well, hold on. Like, So one, I don't think it's like... So this is out in the middle of nowhere, right? Supposedly. Yeah, yeah, this is on the middle of nowhere. So there's no way like another human probably could have inflicted this damage unless there was like a, a hidden Soviet spy base or something nearby. Right. Uh, I I rule out Avalanche just based off the fact that these they're I mean they're not buried in the snow, are they? So some are, however okay, so the first like, five wouldn't that an they Avalanche found... like be so like they'd be like just really covered. 
Yes, but there's a different kind of avalanche we're going to mention later. Okay, okay, okay. This is just, I'm just saying it's Squatch behavior so far. <laughs> <laughs> Broken ribs, fractured skull, dude. You, everyone knows Squatches eat eyeballs, dude. <laughs> it's common knowledge. <laughs> just pick them out. It's like Shrek. Yeah, just, just <laughs> somehow, I don't know how. But Shrek has made his name into two of our three podcasts so Wait, far. Wait, when, when was he in the other one? <laughs> we talked about uh, the Uncanny Valley with Sh- Shrek and Oh, Vienna. God, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. We're, we're SpongeBob people, really. <laughs> I know. No, we're, we're Shrekking it today. We, we're always Shrekking it. <laughs> uh, so the weird thing about these, um, the new bodies that they found, they mm. were actually wearing the clothes of the previously found hikers. So the new hike, the new bodies that they found was in May, a few mm-hmm. months after, you know, the initial bodies were found, but these hikers were wearing the clothes from the bodies that were in their underwear. That is interesting. I mean, maybe, you know what? Like, this is just totally like me. Just, I mean, this is what the podcast is anyways, but like, what if they were just like having fun, right? Like, and they like, stole their clothes and be like haha come get us or something <laughs> and rat out the tent and then like them not like having clothes were like hey come back here and then everyone just died what a horrible prank that would be like, but isn't that some like like that's some like i, I could see that something <laughs> stupid like that being the case of why this happened <laughs> i mean like eight of eight of the nine of these people are really young yeah um, dude believe, young people so are stupid. stupid like um they're always like willing to do like stupid ta- or stupid pranks. Think These are like college fun. students. Oh, hundred percent, dude. Yeah, then that's my theory now. You know, so maybe I, I could totally see that. I don't think that's what happened, but yeah, I could totally yeah, yeah. see that because I personally witnessed stupidity like that. Yeah, happens. It's very commonplace, especially in that age demographic. I feel. <laughs> Ultimately, investigators eventually concluded that the injuries presented on all the bodies would have been would have had to have been caused by a force that no human could possibly possess. This led to their final report, which proposed that an quote unknown compelling natural force unquote had caused the hikers to lose their lives. As you can imagine, the family wasn't exactly happy with this verdict. Yeah, I'd be pretty pissed, you know. You're not saying it's an avalanche. You're not saying it's anything. You're just like, oh, not on force killed your son, daughter, whatever. I mean, it, it, 1950s, no closure. 1950s <laughs> science. What can you do? You know, I mean, you know, one thing that I'd kind of forgotten to mention, too. So the people who were looking who are, you know, the people who actually did the search party, this was townspeople, police. So a lot of volunteers. And then towards the end, towards when they actually found these people the Soviet military became involved in the search efforts. Interesting. So, Interesting. So yeah, it's uh it is kind of odd. Now don't be wrong. The Soviet military is going to have a lot more resources. You know, they're going to have helicopters and surveillance planes and stuff like that. And um, it appeared that a, a helicopters actually was spotted the body or well, the tents, the tent. And then that led to them finding the bodies. So, are you, you, are you know, trying to say that the Russian government is behind this? No, I'm not saying that. That is not is that what you're saying. Uh, what I could I see them doing? Yes, I could, but I, I don't think it was them. It's okay. You can tell me after the podcast. Okay. If you really think it was, <laughs> we'll have a candid conversation after, and then I'll be emailing my boy Vladimir, <laughs> Vladimir, <laughs> Vladdy. <laughs> He's just some guy I know. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> don't we're read too pen, much into we're, that. We're, we're pen pals. <laughs> Uh, disappointed with this vague conclusion the families of the deceased attempted to push the soviet government into conducting a more in-depth investigation ironically the soviets did the exact opposite instead of providing more transparency they decided to classify all the files oh yeah dude this and is aliens photos from this the is... expedition listen <laughs> go ahead go ahead but Further, oh, oh, here, let me finish the sentence. Furthermore, they destroyed all the evidence linked to the event and even declared the mountain pass a restricted area. So you were not allowed to go in here after. This is Russian Area 51, dude. <laughs> like, listen, how many years did the American government? Well, it's weird, man. Listen, I believe in aliens, and the American government said aliens weren't real for so long, and yet Area 51 was it's been this whole mysterious thing for damn near a, a century now. And 
basically like yeah like the evidence that they supplied last year at was it last year where they like declassified like aliens the, over the past couple years yeah it yeah was two, it was technically like a year and a half they ago. basically admitted aliens are real but their evidence was kind of like flimsy at best because it was just this guy being like oh i saw it yeah and it's it ain't like, us it ain't the russians it ain't the chinese but we don't know what it is you know i mean like but when you classify like when the government classifies something i mean you, you usually know something something's a right right so i'm thinking yeti or aliens like you know i feel i could be wrong i wasn't alive back then back then i feel things got classified there was like a really good reason for it but there definitely yeah, aliens. is a, there's a culture of over classification these days but i feel like that's more these days i don't know about back then right that's what i'm saying back then if you classified something it was probably important like it was deemed like this could be you know, a danger to national security. Oh, but you know what? That whatever. might have been uh that that does fall in line with the Cold War, and so maybe they were doing something military wise, working on something military wise. They didn't want Americans to know about. It's true, or you know, they're like, keep in mind, like, anytime something bad happened, whether it was in the U.S. or Russia, we always are blaming each other. That's oh true. my God, this happened! So it, it it there's a good chance it could be the Americans, it could be the Russians. So let's classify oh, do you, everything. Did you ever watch, watch uh, Chernobyl? On oh HBO? yeah, yeah. Chern- I love that was a great miniseries. But right. like the dog episode. One of the set. well, don't you don't have to talk about that. <laughs> but like one of the first things when like they're detecting the radiation in the air in like uh, I think it's like Ukraine or something. Or maybe it was Belarus. I think it was Belarus. Like they go, is it the Americans? You know, like so they're always yeah. thinking like, oh, maybe the Americans were behind this or something. Yeah, and and I think that classifying things, like just jumping to then classifying things, was a way to almost protect things. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, let's classify it. Let's investigate it. Let's make sure that you know we need to. Let's make sure all our ducks are in a row before we're like, hey we can let this go to the public kind of thing because you know no one will admit it but the cia was in russia and the kgb was in america you know we were all spying on each other you know no one will ever say that but that's oh, dude, going there's on. so much stuff we don't know like shout out to one of my favorite podcasts ever uh they're they're called uh stuff you should know used to love listening to them on my commute when i would have a one hour commute into work and one of my favorite episodes ever they did was uh there was one sh- uh, I think it was in Florida, but Nazis actually invaded America as spies. Like, if you listen to the podcast, they kind of go into how like they kind of just like didn't succeed, and I think one of them really like embraced American life and just kind of was like <laughs> going so to the movie. Here, you know, I think one guy was around. just going to the movies like every day or something like that, just like. But like it, it, the stuff you don't know and that you find out later, like through like other sources that aren't in the textbook, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, I do believe the KGB and like stuff were probably in america during the cold war i mean it still goes on today to be honest with you oh probably our allies spy on us we spy on our allies oh, we spy yeah. on our enemies our enemies spy on us everybody's spying <laughs> that's what they do they're just much better at now you don't need you to spy on your neighbors room. all the time man that's a couple of documents i got yeah. like you see, you're peeping uh, tom <laughs> the jersey monster house you ever see that movie monster house was that the animated one it is yeah i might have but like kind of like it might have just been on in the background it's a great movie, by the way. Anyway, it's a good Halloween movie. Anyways, he's like spying on the old man because he thinks there's something wrong, which I guess turns out there is. But when he finally goes into his house later, I won't spoil anything, but he has Just to spoil go it. No, no one's watching Monster. Okay. It's like a 20 year old movie, dude. Whatever. He dies. Like the old oh guy my dies. God. Spoilers, dude. <laughs> the old guy dies, quote unquote. He actually doesn't die. Um, and the, Spoilers. <laughs> the house comes to life. They go into the house to try to fight it. And he looks at the window and it turns out like there's binoculars that are on like this device where it like springs to the window. And he's like, he was watching me. So that's what I have. I have that mechanism, but it's on every single window. I'm watching everybody. It's like that one Alfred Hitchcock movie where the guy breaks his leg and he's like spying on everyone. I forgot what it's called. He's bored. What else there to do? Yeah, it's true. There was no, uh, no internet back then. (laughs) So because the results of the investigation provided no sufficient answers to the weird circumstances surrounding the deceased hikers, researchers, law enforcement personnel, and conspiracy theorists have all happily jumped into the conversation to fill in the blanks. It's theory time. We get to officially talk about all the theories as if we haven't already talked about a lot of the theories. I know. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's basically been. And you know what? Theory one, I wish it was. I wish it was written in a way where I could get into my Yeti, but I better have the Yeti theory. If it's yours, the I'm going to read it. Yeti's in here. Don't worry. Yeah, I but promise. if it's not under me, 
If it's under you, I'm reading it. I'll let you <laughs> like, take it. You, it's all yours. Okay. It was under you. You sob, dude. <laughs> you can have the Yeti. The Yeti's all yours. All I right, don't want to reading anyway, so I'm not going to complain. I know. I haven't even like read. I think theory one is the most obvious and grounded. It was an avalanche that killed Dyatlov and his fellow hikers. This would essentially explain that the tent being cut from inside, as they would have had, as they would have needed to escape, uh, the supplies being left behind. As a result of leaving in such a hurry, they would have been exposed to negative 30 degrees temperatures without proper attire. Uh, this would eventually result in paradoxal undressing. According to the National Institute of Health, paradoxal undressing might be explained by changes in peripheral vasoconstriction in the deeply hypothermic in a deeply hypothermic hypothermic person. It represents the last effort of the victim and is followed almost immediately by unconsciousness and death. So this is essentially like your body's last hurrah. Like it knows it's dying. Yeah. So it generates whatever but limited energy you, you have. I mean, maybe there's a there's probably a rumble right with an avalanche and they could hear it. But well, but so I mean, you, uh, if you're cutting open thing. a tent, I mean, aren't you at least grabbing a jacket? So here's the thing. Like, first of all, uh, for those who don't know, what paradoxical undressing is like that was definitely like the textbook way to read it. Um, but basically, your body realize it's shutting down this is like now or never you need to get yourself out of the cold or you're going to die so whatever energy you have left in your body it uses to generate heat and your the sensation is that you're so hot like unbearably hot you have to take you take off your clothes that's what it is (laughs) um sounds like a panic attack (laughs) it kind of is it's like your but your panic mode i mean let's face it by the time you've reached that your brain and your thought train of thought is so scrambled you just are reacting to almost like carnal freaking feelings like whatever like that reptile brain that i always talk about like it's the way to like it's only focused on survival that's pretty much the only thing that's functioning at that point you're not (laughs) thinking rationally you know, you're not thinking of probably about loved ones or anything at that point. You're just thinking, I need to survive. That's it. I'm going to do whatever I have to survive. Um, it's a really sad way to go, actually. It sounds horrific. And to be honest with you. With, and again, I'm actually not going to, I'm not going to argue for this avalanche. I'll, I saved mine for last. But Another this, spoiler. an avalanche, you're right. It wouldn't explain them because they were found uh the tent was found only with a little bit of snow on it if it was an avalanche you think it would be completely covered oh, it would be completely covered um the tent would be covered they had skis that were still stuck <laughs> in the ground that would have gotten you know smashed those wouldn't be standing up they probably would have snapped it probably snapped the tree lot well they're pretty well i don't know what skis were right back then skis nowadays probably wouldn't they're pretty strong um trees would be snapped 70 years ago it's true it's just blocks of wood basically basically um you know but, well, the other thing, too, with an avalanche is you had said, wouldn't you grab a jacket or boots? Well, the problem is, like, I don't know if you know, but when I mean, if you got enough time goes, to, if you got enough time to cut open the tent, right? Like, uh, the jacket's probably right there. Dude. So they're Just sleeping. You got to think, though. They're sleeping. All of a sudden, avalanche. You don't have time to do that because an avalanche is moving, like, very fast. You don't have a lot of time. You need to get out. And, there, you know, your first thought isn't, like oh, it's cold outside. I need to do that. Your first thought is there's an avalanche coming. I need to get the hell out of here. And then by the time you get out, it's like, oh, shit. Like, I'm going to die now because I can't. I'm going to freeze to death. You know, they were body heat, baby. Yeah. Well, huddle for warmth. (laughs) That's what the fire pit was probably for down the road. Yeah. Um, But admittedly, this doesn't explain, you know, radioactivity, radioactivity, you know, missing eye that. I mean, I guess, but it's, it's a lot. I don't of, know, man. It's a lot of force. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard of. Uh, I know there's avalanche victims, right? But I haven't heard of like missing eyes. Maybe I haven't done enough research on avalanches. Well, honestly, oh, the other thing too is every when they did the autopsies. Granted, I'm sure the Soviets did. You know, Soviet military personnel did the autopsy. They what said that. that Was that supposed to mean? It's just meaning that they. What are you getting at? Build their, they're going to build their own narrative. That's all I'm going to say. Um, they were all breathing when they died. You got to get my notes. So back. in an avalanche, when you them. die, you usually die from asphyxiation. So you. Yeah. Tech- yeah. Usually like you do kind of survive the impact, but you're so covered that you're going to suffocate to death. Right. And the thing is, like, people are like, well, of course, they're breathing. They die. But the thing is, 
the second you stop breathing, it's not like you're instantly dead. Oh Don't no, wrong. you're not going to live very long. Yeah. So you're like until oxygen cuts off in the brain, and you're basically yeah, it's over. Right. I mean, the, 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 I think one of the <clears> scariest <throat> things that researchers started to discover is that when you're dead, like you stop breathing, your heart's done, your brain's still going for a bit, which is absolutely terrifying. But yeah, so no, I don't think it was a normal kind of avalanche, if I'm being honest. Theory two, the Soviet military conducted a nuclear weapons test near the mountain. Yuri Yudin, who was actually supposed to be the 10th hiker, but had to turn back on the second day due to illness, was asked to come and assist investigators in identifying the bodies of the dead mountain climbers. During this time with authorities, he claimed that there were some items present that were not brought with them on the journey. This included glasses, an extra set of skis, and some cloth that he claimed looked like it came from a soldier's uniform. Because of this, he suggested that it was quite possible that the Soviet military beat them to the bodies and attempted to clean up the scene. What would they be cleaning up? What further provides credence to this possibility of a nuclear weapon being used is the fact that many people throughout the area claim to have seen flying glowing spheres hovering around the mountain around the time the hikers would have perished. Could this have been a missile being used by the Soviet military? This would explain why they classified stuff if it was a nuclear ex like experimentation. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, because they're not going to they're not going to tell the they're, world. They don't want that. the Americans to know that, hey, we're messing around with nukes here post World War II. You know, that's kind of what the whole Cold War was about. Like it was a nuclear arms race, even though they went on the literally. So it's impossible to say who has the biggest nuclear bomb now, but they have they conducted the tests. They tested the largest. And nukes. where else to do it in the middle of the tundra of Siberia exactly. where there's like no population, which makes me question earlier when you, there's a, a point about locals who's who's living out there. <laughs> I mean, there's probably a lot of like, you know, people just kind Little of live villages. off the grid, you know, yeah. they they're the Jadens of the world. Yeah. You know, they they hunt and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, it's cheaper to hunt probably than it is to freaking like bring food in. It's true. So. The radiation signatures that were present in the clothes of the deceased would be explained by the nuclear radi or the nuclear experimentation theory. Major blunt point injuries present on the bodies. I'm not sure how that would be explained. Maybe if like the military came there and roughed them up a little bit. Maybe. I mean, maybe like if they were far enough away from the bomb, but close enough to get knocked on their ass. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, and the third degree burns could be from the missile, or it could be like. Like radiation burns are real too, right? If oh, Chernobyl definitely. taught me anything, it taught me Ooh. that it's probably one of the, if not the most terrific way to go. Yeah, you don't even look uh, like a human being after radiation all Radiation poisoning is no joke. So I don't know if the body's decomposed like that, but that'd probably explain if that was real or not. Uh, and while this theory is a popular one, there are some factors that might make it a bit difficult to believe. Uh, there was no evidence of an explosion. Although I'm sure the government could make that the case. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If a nuclear weapon had been deployed, you'd think that there would be something to suggest that there had been an explosion, yet there wasn't. And additionally, there was no record of a missile launch in the area. Neither the Soviets nor any other country reported, detect reported or detected such an event. Also, when you consider the fact that Chernobyl tripped alarms all over Europe, this idea became a tad harder bit to believe. But yeah, because... maybe they weren't... Like, I mean, Chernobyl was about 20, what was it, the 80s, 1980? Uh, yeah, it was early this 80s, is 19, I think. So, Dyatlov Pass is 1959. Chernobyl yeah. would have been 1986. So, that's almost yeah. 30 years difference in... Yeah, technology in, would have gotten better. Like It could have gotten better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Kind of to go on to, uh, you know, we're not going to oh. spear off it because a whole other episode we'll have to do, but... Yeah, you know, spearing off into Area 51, one of the excuses that the military provided was that the reason why they were so secretive about it is because it was a balloon, but it wasn't a weather balloon. It was actually a balloon mm -hmm. that was designed to detect a nuclear bomb going off. Now, whether you believe that or not, that's not really the point of this, but that was back then, you know, around that time. So, you know, who knows? We don't know how efficient or effective that um system is or it's all was. classified now i mean yeah we don't know we don't know at all um but if that was if it worked they should have been able to detect this you know what i mean mm -hmm. because that was the whole point of it and i'm sure we were working with our allies the uk and you know most of europe western europe to uh you know all have our ears out for a potential nuke launch so i still say that if they used a bomb like a nuclear mm. bomb it would have it would have gotten detected unless they somehow invented like a tiny nuclear bomb, but that doesn't really make much sense. You know, the whole I mean, point of it. 
it does raise questions why their bodies were radioactive, right? So oh, like, definitely. That's there's, weird. <laughs> it's there's, weird. <laughs> I mean, maybe it wasn't a bomb per se, but maybe there was a high high doses of radiation in the area that probably could have killed them. Theory three is kind of similar to the second one. However, um, this theory states that the hikers were actually part of a KGB operation that went horribly wrong. According to author Alexei Rakuten, author of the book Dyatlov Pass, it is possible the party of mountain climbers were actually Soviet spies working for the KGB. As it turned out, most of the hikers were students at the Oral Polytechnic Institute, which was well known to pump out engineering graduates. Because of this focus on engineering, alumni from this school were typically highly sought after by the Russian military and brought into their nuclear research programs. Rakuten proposes that these students could have been recruited by Semyon Zolotarov, the last hiker to join the team, to carry out a top secret mission. The primary reason for the author, author's focus on Zolotorov was because he had years of acclaimed military service within the Russian, within the Soviet military, and even had close ties to the NKVD, which was basically the Russian secret police. Additionally, Zolotorov, I should have not put his name in here this many times. Hey, uh, no, you know what? This was originally meant for me, so you were trying to set me up for failure, dude. Uh, additionally, reverse. <laughs> Uno reverse. Additionally, Zolotarov worked in the same nuclear facility that Yuri, Yuri Doroshenko was employed by. Yuri Doroshenko was actually one of the other climbers. Yeah. Uh, and to Wait, add so further, he worked at one of those facilities. Yes. And to add further Well, you would have thought he, maybe he would have known about it. Right. Well, you think, but here we go. This is kind of about the radiation part. To add further speculation, Zolotarov <laughs> joined the hikers party at the very last minute. He like joined, like I think, a few days before it was supposed to go out. All of a sudden, he's like, I want to come with you. Apparently, around this time, a popular practice by the Russians was to plant radioactive material in remote areas. As a result, rival operatives would detect these signatures and go out and look for it. This would ultimately result in the enemy being sent on a wild goose chase. Mm. So it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with the, you know, maybe maybe Doroshenko was out there. Maybe it was all like the ruse of like going on this hike was so he could place this stuff out there you know right it could be i mean he could have like he was, on his he, was on a, he was on a mission but he was like using the hikers as kind of like cover cover yeah and maybe you know maybe he was teamed up with yori maybe could be. and that's why he um, he he uh what do you call it he came when he wasn't supposed to right he wasn't planning to come but then he he showed up this Zol- right Zolator- we're talking zolatorif right yeah yeah so Semyon, him and Yuri Semyon, both worked yeah. in this facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and maybe he showed up to be like Yuri, comrade. Yeah. Is the plan honestly. still a go? Very well could be. Who knows? I like this one. I'm not going to say I believe in it, but I I do like this one. It's very interesting, and I actually hadn't known about this theory until like a, until I was actually researching this. This mm-hmm. is not one that kept popping up. This is kind of a I can believe this. So is this the one you want to believe? No, I mean, I want, okay. I'd like to believe it, but I don't think it's the case. Because I could, I could believe that Yuri was an operative of the KGB, but the other hikers were kind of just like innocent bystanders that I mean, happened to uh, wrong place, wrong time. I mean, you know? Stranger Things taught me anything. A guy named Yuri, he's gonna, he's working with the KGB and the Russian military. <laughs> was his name Yuri? He's the pilot. Yeah. Oh, he was. I actually, like, I was thinking of the scientist. What was his name? Alexei. Alexei. Which is actually the name of the author, right? Of the book? Yeah, Alexei Rakuten. Yeah. Mm. Maybe it's him. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> anyways, uh, Rakuten proposes that the hikers were sent into the wilderness to scope out and eliminate a covert CIA cell that was apparently searching for radiation signatures. Unfortunately for them, CIA operatives didn't make it easy for them and may have eliminated the Soviet hikers. Uh, This would explain the radiation signatures, uh, the supposed military clothing and unknown supplies identified by Yuri Yudin, who was the the guy who did not go on the hike. Or he did go on the hike, but Mm -hmm. he turned around. He's the only survivor. Uh, Yeah. So unfortunately, it still doesn't explain the the injuries, though, because they did mention earlier these injuries couldn't be caused by a person. And I, I know the CIA, you know, they're operatives who actually like, fight and who aren't stuck behind a desk Mm -hmm. know how to fight and do things and whatever but you've been watching too much black widow i know well yes yeah natasha romanoff wasn't a bad movie but anyway i never saw it anyways that's neither here nor there but yeah it doesn't explain the 
all the you know the horrendous injuries i'm pretty sure it's not in the cia playbook to rip someone's tongue out i'm pretty sure and then blame it on a sasquatch i mean (laughs) you know maybe it is in the playbook right maybe it's like let's make this look so unbearably weird like they'll never believe the kgb did this maybe maybe that's it who knows so Um, i i don't it's an interesting theory but i don't (sighs) i don't go i don't I don't buy this one. This one, this one's just really weird. Also, like, yes, I get the whole like spying on, you know, you know, following traces of nuclear or radioactivity and stuff. But the thing is, like, radioactivity is everywhere. Like, if you go to Grand Central Station in New York City, mm-hmm. you're bombarded with radiation. Um, granted, it's not. I don't. If think you do those little scanning, but... if you do those little scanning machines at the airport, dude. Yeah, that's radiation. Like, I mean, there's radiation. That's like a million you're... X-rays right there, dude. Everything emits every like electronic technically emits radiation. No, it's not. I'm spreading misinformation. Don't believe me. It's it's not that bad. Just go get in the no. scanner. It's not ionized. That's the thing. A lot of things give off radiation, but if it's not ionized, you're it's you're probably okay. I'm not a physicist, so I won't I won't comment on that. Yeah, we don't know Jack about that, but but yeah, yes, radiation's everywhere, but not dangerous. Oh, no, radiation a, a radiologist. Everywhere. I'm sorry, I'm not a radiologist. <laughs> I think that's technically like more of like a medical application of it i think it'd be I like a i don't know i just know whenever i'm getting a chest x-ray or something they're like behind this like wall and i'm like is this safe and they're like yeah yep. of course as they have an iron curtain and exactly. like they have iron clothes they're on in a basically. completely different room Put goggles on shut the same door. thing when uh same thing when i'm at the dentist and they're taking x-rays of my mouth and they're like way over there it's true did you know bananas radioactive Stop it. I swear to God, you can look it up. Stop this. A, a banana is radioactive, naturally. Anyway, let's talk about the Yeti. <laughs> I'll put so many bananas in your car. Dude. <laughs> Listen, the only really real theory that we could probably take away from this that is the actual cause of these this unfortunate tragedy is the Yeti. The Yeti. And listen, Discovery Channel put out a two-hour special called Russian Yeti, The Killer Lives. <laughs> and... I don't know when it happened, but Discovery used to be a channel like, I mean, it, it gave us Shark Week, right? God bless Shark Week. I always love Shark Week. It does. But it used to be an educational channel. And then I remember like my my cousin's ex-wife, <laughs> uh, went, like years ago, she's like, she came to my aunt in like the family, like saying, did you know mermaids are real? <laughs> oh, boy. And we're like, Laura, where are you getting this from? And apparently Discovery had put out like <laughs> a fake mermaid documentary, like stylized as a documentary. They did the same thing with Megalodon, like the, the gigantic shark. They said it was still alive. Like, I don't know when they went like really far off the deep end of like, just like they became the sci-fi channel essentially. <laughs> well, history kind of did that too. The history, the history channel. channel. Yeah. Ancient alien. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't it, know. What... Television got a little whack. Cable cable went downhill. But the Yeti would explain the fractured skulls, broken ribs, ripped out tongue, missing eyeball, uh, just ripped apart tent, right? Except the Yeti might not be real, so that's kind of what it doesn't explain. <laughs> and, and unless the Yeti is an extra dimensional being, he should have radiation signature. But Something you know what? That? Maybe they were maybe it was just a KGB experiment to place the radiation out there but then the yeti came and maybe, maybe the yeti was a grizzly bear maybe the yeti was just a really hairy russian man who worked for the kgb <laughs> or a bear or a bear do bear i don't know i mean there's bears out there i don't know there's got to be high. bears there's got to be bears out in siberia bears we're gonna do a quick fact check bears in siberia the east siberian brown bear this is a big boy hmm you can get it up to 2.75 Two point seven five meters, which is roughly about nine feet. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, I mean it's big. Yeah, mm. you know, actually, a bear. I, the theory of a bear. Granted, a bear would. A bear is going to rip you apart. There's me claw marks, me teeth marks. You know. Well, that's that He's explains the ripped you. up tenth. But a bear would eat them. Probably keep in mind it's it's the tundra. There's not a lot of animals. If it goes through all the maybe energy, to were, hunt maybe something, the food. Maybe he likes hot food. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, they were warm at first. <laughs> I mean, but... not when you're in a blizzard. <laughs> You're not, <laughs> not when you got hypothermia, right? So is this where the hill you're going to die on? The Yeti? The Yeti did it? Yeti slash bear. Yeti slash bear. That's where. So this is the theory you're going to you're going to stop at. You're good. Oh, with this yeah. One. No, this one. This one's mine. This is my baby. 
Are you sure? Because the next one is pretty well. This pretty is, fun too. This is my other baby, <laughs> and my other baby is aliens. Everything is always aliens deep. <laughs> and as mentioned earlier, large gro- glowing orbs were seen flying throughout the sky around the area around the time of Dyatlov's party uh, was in the Ural Mountains. That would explain the glowing orbs, right? Aliens, you know, like strange yeah, objects in the sky. Like what, they don't call them UFOs anymore. What are they? They're uh, UAPs. Is it UAPs? Yeah, what is it? What is it? On an, on unidentified unidentified aerial phenomenon. Phenomenon. Yep. And some people, including Lev Ivanov, who was the lead investigator of the Dyatlov case, believed that it was possible that the spears may have had something to do with it. In fact, it might explain the radiation, right? Maybe aliens are using highly radioactive equipment and ships. I mean, for the record, I do believe in aliens. I just don't think they had anything to play in Oh, this. you do? I feel like at the beginning of the podcast, you said no. Oh, no, I've always believed in aliens. I just don't believe mm. in ghosts. Because mm. ghosts aren't real. I mean, they are. And neither is Bigfoot. I mean, he is. Or the Yeti. I mean, he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Ivanov was quoted as saying, I suspected at the time, and I'm almost sure now, that these bright flying spheres had a direct connection to the group's death. Well, he was almost sure. See, almost even sure. he put a little bit of doubt. In I there. mean, you always got to be a little, a little bit of healthy skepticism. Maybe he well, thought if you put a little bit of skepticism, he wouldn't get like blackballed by the military. By the KGB, locked up in the gulag. That's probably where he is now. Or he's what makes this now. theory a bit more compelling is the fact that Ivanov was instructed by the Soviet military to not include this information in his report and declare the case closed. This ultimately led investigators to settle on the unknown compelling natural force statement that they gave the families. And maybe this was all done to cover something up. But you know what? Is this from the book where he was instructed? Like, do we actually have proof that like, like, what's the proof that he was instructed by the military to be like, no, say nothing. There were, supposedly there were reports that he was, him and his team were told basically close, close this case. And keep the alien stuff out of it because and the spheres keep those out of it because this is all bs can i get the my theory now this is the one that i believe you've been so nice to me i got a boring i'm sorry super boring boo boo him so the theory then the last theory is it was a delayed slab avalanche (sighs) now shut the hell up Uh, okay, so recently, more and more researchers have begun to cling to the theory that a delayed slab avalanche may have caused the deaths of Dyatlov's climbing brigade. This phenomenon is essentially a series of mini disturbances that occur throughout a sheet of snow and end in a mini avalanche occurring. So essentially, you know, let's say you have 10 feet of snow, right? Well, the top four feet basically get disturbed and that slab of snow comes sliding off. Hmm. So how this happened is essentially... So, wait, let me get this straight. Is this already, like, is this avalanche snow of 10 feet? Or is this just, like, already resting 10 feet? And then the so four feet on top is the avalanche. The four feet on top is the avalanche. Gotcha. But the okay. remaining six stays. I mean, I don't yeah. know how many feet of snow is just an and example. And that would explain why, like, nothing was really buried or covered. Right. So it is possible that when the group originally dug into the slope... They may have set off a mini butterfly effect that wouldn't produce any tangible outcome. God, that movie's so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> until the middle of the night. <laughs> it's, I never saw it. It's 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 a piece of work, dude. Let's watch it and then get we can talk about it like okay. privately. <laughs> Fair enough. Eventually, when the snow did let go, it may have hit the tent and injured some of the climbers. So you got to think with when they're chipping into the snow to have the tent set up. The tent is like right here, right? So there's still snow acting as a wall to protect them from the wind. Well, when they chipped here, this snow here just went like that, like right across the tent. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it was the middle of the night, so they could have been sleeping. Even the ones that were awake might have been kind of sitting up and also have a wall of snow just smashing you in the face. It's not going super fast, but it's still heavy. Like that's a lot of force coming. Plus, you know, who knows what's in that snow? rocks branches you know pieces of your tent w- other people you know coming and hitting you in the face so that could have fractured your skull yeah um and no i'm not saying i don't know if that's gonna rip off your tongue though well i'm gonna get to that I- i'm telling you i got ammunition man so far it's still just nothing but like conjecture and snooze snoozeville well, dude i am building up to it let me get to it <laughs> <laughs> eventually when the snow let go it would have hit the tent and injured some of the climbers 
This would have made the hikers believe that a full-fledged avalanche was occurring and have caused them to flee out of fear that they were buried alive. So it scared them. They're thinking an avalanche on the gun. They bolt out of the tent. It's negative 30 degrees. And then you add the wind chill. We're talking like probably negative 50. So they're outside. They didn't have time to get dressed. They were scared an avalanche was happening. By the time they get far enough away from the tent and, and the avalanche, they realize, oh, shit, no avalanche happened. Mm. You know, an avalanche is going to go all the way down the mountain. So they're running as fast as they can. And by the time they realize there's no avalanche, it's in the middle they of the night. They can't lost. see anything. They got lost. They're cold. They don't have the stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's. Which that's if it. they got lost, I mean, would they have <laughs> lamps or would it be pitch black? Well, actually, we're going to get to those lamps. Well, I've um, seen the lamps. So, you know, that would explain the, the injuries. Um, as far as the radiation goes, two of the hikers, those two we mentioned earlier, um, Yuri and the other guy who joined at the last minute, they actually worked in the same facility, which we mentioned earlier. But one thing we didn't mention earlier was they were actually both tasked with cleaning up a nuclear disaster in Moscow. Uh, it was called the Kishim disaster. Not as well known as Chernobyl, but there was, it caused a lot of issues. And these people worked on it and yeah, they're going to be radioactive. It's going to happen. Uh, also, in addition to that, the lamps they had were filled with thorium, which is also radioactive. Um, so that's the fuel. So radiation checked. And as far as the tongue and eyes, uh, scavengers, birds, that's where they go. They eat your tongue. They eat your eyes. Case closed. Nah, that's definitely Yeti behavior. Done. <laughs> Sorry. That's like not even believable. It's not, it's not believable. So a Yeti is believable. Mm, yeah. But you don't think an avalanche getting people out of their tent. No. And, okay. All right. Okay. Well, okay. Why are they radioactive? Why is a Yeti making people radioactive? Because everyone knows Godzilla is radioactive. So why wouldn't, <laughs> why wouldn't a cryptid like the Yeti be radioactive? Okay. So here you go. I'm going to actually I'll help you. So the chimp, there was a chimpanzee and mm, yeah. it fell into like a vat of radioactive liquid and it grew into Sasquatch or Yeti. There you go. There and you go. I guess it, they, bleached its hair white well no he just he's covered in snow there's so much snow he's covered in snow okay so he's actually like brown or like whatever and and everyone knows that he loves snow cones too i mean he does and he he likes lemon Lemon. Lemon. they're lemon (laughs) they are lemon lemon. (laughs) all right well okay so you're to to turn back to a somber note (laughs) the legacy of dyatlov's ill-fated climb is carried on via the dyatlov foundation Uh, this organization works to solve the mystery of the dyatlov pass incident through continuous research and inquiry. Additionally, they also maintain the Dyatlov Museum, which serves to preserve the memory of the dead hikers. Today, all nine hikers are buried at the Mikhail Ofsko Cemetery in Yekaterinsburg, Russia. Above their tomb sits a large engraved monolith, which bears the names and pictures of those died in the mountain during the fateful expedition. To this day, their deaths still remain a mystery, and it begs the question, what do you think happened to the Dyatlov hikers all those years ago? Was it a military cover-up, a Yeti, aliens, or was it just simply a poorly timed avalanche that Austin put out there, which (laughs) obviously it's not. Unfortunately, we'll probably never know for sure the answer unless it gets declassified or if it has been declassified. What we definitely can say, however, is that the mountain has rightfully earned the title given to it by the locals all those years ago. Death Mountain definitely sums up this place quite nicely. Good job. You got that in the first shot. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, yeah. So you believe in the Yeti, and I and believe, you believe in, in something. I believe that in the truth. Has no science that backs it up. <laughs> I, b- I believe in the truth, but you know that's okay. That's what makes us fun. If we I both believe were... in the alternate truth, we we need someone the who... real truth, the <laughs> censored <laughs> truth. You know, there's always good and evil. Your truth evil. and you know the lie and. I need I need the other side and I'll even that. <laughs> Listen, if I'm cutting all the BS aside, it probably was that slab avalanche. But wouldn't a Yeti be so much cooler? Oh my god, yeah. Like trust me, I don't No, I don't... no, 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 no. I, I get it. You're you're just you're anti Homo sapien. So like no. you don't like you don't like what? Neanderthals, anything like any ape type creature. So you have a Yeti bias. <laughs> I mean, I our old supervisor says he exists. He hunted them, dude. He hunted Squatch back yeah, in the well, day, dude. Well, he never caught himself a pelt, so just, just saying. Well, I mean, they're big creatures, dude. <laughs> Everyone knows they're actually, bulletproof. <laughs> turns out he's actually the most successful Sasquatch hunter ever. And just no one believes him. If you want to see us hunt Sasquatch, go check there our other channel out. <laughs> we should probably play that game again. We it, was, it was a lot of fun. It's gotten a lot better, too.
I heard it's gotten better. I'm going to plug away quick. Let's get those plug, in there. Plug it in. So thanks again, guys, for joining us on the You Go First podcast. We hope you had fun and maybe even learned something today like that. Fernando's always wrong. One of the better takeaways from today's episode might be something along the lines of maybe don't climb a mountain that is literally called Death Mountain. I think that's a good lesson. Uh, if you want to watch, you should go or, climb Death Mountain. I should climb. Let's go together. No, just you. You got to carry me, though. I want you to get a little <laughs> backpack for me and carry me. Who? How do you think? Li- literally, shouldn't that be reversed? <laughs> Oh, you trying to say something? Are you trying to say something? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to watch or hear us again, you can find us on YouTube at You Go First Pod or look for the You Go First Podcast on your favorite audio only streaming platform. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a five star rating, a positive review, and maybe even subscribe to the channel. Additionally, if you want to reach out and tell Fernando that he's wrong, <laughs> Uh, you, you don't have do to so. tell me I'm wrong this many times. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you let me just that. believe in the fun stuff so people actually watch. <laughs> you can email us at yougofirst.tv at gmail.com. And Send us suggestions on what to cover next. Yeah. Like, well, uh, I also implore someone to keep a uh, like a, a scoreboard of, up there of like all the ridiculous things that you agree with and actually keep a scoreboard of all the times that we actually agree on something. It'll probably never happen. Yeah, no, for sure. Cause one of us has to be the skeptic and one of us has to be the believer. <laughs> right. And one of us it's has no to... fun when t- there's just two believer or two skeptics. <laughs> one of us have to be honest. Right. <laughs> well, it's obviously me because you're the biggest liar I know. <laughs> Well, if you want to go watch us hunt a Sasquatch, you can all you can go do that on YouTube at You Gophers Gaming. So we play all kinds of spooky games over there, mm-hmm. and that's a fun one. I mean, sometimes there's one of our early videos. It is, so it might not be the best, but I mean, it's we'll make a new one eventually where it's actually yeah, we'll, like we'll, better. Like we'll probably we'll probably remaster some of our old videos. Uh yeah, I, I think so because the early ones are. Excuse me. They're pretty horrendous. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's fine. It's okay. You got to start from somewhere. And you can't you can't erase your origin story. That's Which, rewriting history. That's true. We don't do that. We don't do that. We're not. Never mind. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> All right. I, I think that about does it, right? Uh, stay spooky. Yeah, stay spooky, everyone. Have a good night. Yep. Good night. Sasquatch ain't real. Dude, fuck you. <laughs>